All right, everyone, welcome. Um, this is a lot more people than I expected to be in here. Um, so this is let's see, an introduction to Krita, the uh, open source digital painting program. A um, little bit of truth time. When I submitted this presentation, I had only played around with Krita. I didn't know most of the UI. I didn't know most of the features. I just thought it was a cool program, and I thought it would be a cool talk. When I actually started getting into it, I think this deck ended up being like 100-something slides. It's ridiculously robust. It's an amazing program, and I've absolutely fallen in love with it. Um, so as I said, Krita is an open-source digital painting program, um, similar to GIMP, with the exception that GIMP was modeled after Photoshop, which is uh, for mainly photo manipulation originally, touching up, pictures you take, things like that. Krita is more along the lines of Corel Painter. They wanted to just f uh, focus on... Digital artwork, concept, cartooning, things like that. Um, so most of the tools are around there, but there are a couple of surprising things that you can do that are more traditionally used for um, image manipulation. So today we'll go ahead and take a look at the program from a beginner's point of view. As I said, I was a beginner when I started this, um, so you'll have to excuse me if I have to refer to my notes quite a bit, um, but we're going to start from the ground up. Oh, bounce around for me. <laughs> nah, that's about as full screen as it's going to get, I think. Unfortunately, F11 is not doing anything. Let's see, let's try this. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, apologies. It looks like that's where we're going to get. Let's do the presentation. How about the presentation? That's what you're talking about? Right hand side. I can't even see from here. Right there. <laughs> uh, that doesn't work. All right. Well, we'll just roll with this. And again, this is actually only the second time I've ever done public speaking. Um, the first presentation that I did was completely about me. So it was really easy. Uh, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't have to worry about all this stuff. Um, You're doing great. Thank you. <laughs> um, so let's go ahead and move on. So why Krita? Why did I choose Krita? Um, I love art. That's, that's essentially what it is. Um, ever since I was a young man, I watched my brother, who's three years older than me, start drawing. And I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. So I followed in his footsteps, and I continued to draw, and I even went to school to be a digital artist, um, but with a focus on 3D modeling and animation rather than 2D, which is what this is. Um, I accidentally tripped and stumbled into a program called the Open Cloud Academy that Rackspace put on, and they trained me to be a Linux administrator. And I never look back. I'm a, I'm a Linux administrator at Rackspace now. I love my job to death. Um, but it's introduced me to all this cool open source stuff. And I happen to find Krita. And it just brings me back to what I grew up loving. So using my new technical skills of reading documentation, because as Linux admins, we love documentation, um, I've decided to, to try to get back into this stuff. Um, let's see. I love everything about art. I love looking at art. I love checking it out. I love to see what other people create, um, not just with Krita, but with any program, um, 3D models, everything. It's just, I love it. I love to try it. Um, you know, after three years as a Linux administrator, it's been a long time since I've been into this stuff. Um, but it's a blast. Every time I sit down and start drawing, I just feel like a kid again. Did you um, draw this? I did draw this. These slides are my contribution. Um, the rest of them are just screenshots, but these are my cartoons. Uh, and I'm actually not too good at art. But that doesn't stop me from trying. You know, you practice, you practice, you practice, you get a little better. Um, and one of the best things about Krita is it has all these awesome tools to really help you get over some of the, I mean, we'll go through it, but they're, they're just things that improve your art right away. You don't have to know all the classical techniques and things like that. You learn a couple cool tricks, and you get a great-looking art, right? Um, and the last thing that I love is encouraging other people to do art. 
Um, that's actually my buddy Alex, who's sitting right over there. He, uh, he has not yet done this, um, but I scheduled it for later. Uh, my hope through this talk is that you guys will also find the program interesting, download it, pick it up, just start scribbling on it, see what you can come up with. Um, like I said, the tools are, are, are amazing for just getting interesting things right off the bat. A little bit of history uh, around Krita. Um, it was originally developed as a proof of concept QT GUI, uh, wrapper for GIMP. Um, I looked into it. I'm not a programmer. I don't know much about building GUIs or anything like that. But apparently at the time, this really cheesed people off. People were not happy that um, the gentleman who did this was able to do this. It's kind of a multi-toolkit programming. They didn't like it. They're, I mean, you can read email threads where they're just flaming each other back and forth and everybody's unhappy. Um, so they, they went ahead and got over to KDE, and KDE started developing this K-Image K shop, um, but ran into licensing issues, so they renamed it to Crayon, which, not surprisingly, also ran into <laughs> trademark issues. Um, so finally, the name Credo was chosen in 2002. And if you look online, a lot of people are like, well, I don't know how to pronounce it. Is it Krita? Is it Krita? What is it? It's actually Krita. It's a Swedish word. It means chalk or crayon, I believe. Um, I'm from Texas. So I have a drawl, and I'll usually say Krita instead. Um, so forgive me if I'm pronouncing it wrong. If there's any purists in here, somebody gets mad at me, I apologize. Um, in 2004, the first public release was included with K-Office as part of that suite. And um, prior to 2009, again, they wanted to do something like, like Photoshop and like GIMP. Um, but in 2009, they, they decided to switch that focus to purely concept art and doing... Um, coloring and things like that. Uh, in 2013, the Krita Foundation was created to provide support. They actually do have a fully supported version that you can buy for production reasons. Um, and, you know, you get all the, the goodies that come with it. You can request features, whatever. Um, and then they've got a few. There's a, there's a version that's available on Steam also um, called Krita Gemini, which is optimized for tablets or convertibles, uh, touchscreens. And uh, they were also kick-started in 2015 they were fully funded uh, with 30,000 euros with just under 1,000 backers. So, and the Kickstarter's still up. Uh, they're pushing towards the 3.0 release. Current version right now is 2.9. So how do you get credit? Yes? Just on that last part, uh, do they do that every year? Uh, the, the Kickstarter thing for different features? Yeah, so the question was, do they re-up the Kickstarter for different features? It looks like it's still ongoing, but I'll be honest with you, I'm not real familiar with Kickstarter. Um, so I was just reading through it. I know they were fully funded reading their timeline and stuff like that. Uh, but I know it's still open, and you can still make donations to the project. Um, so where do you get Krita? Krita.org is where you get it. Um, it's available for several different distributions. Um, the Ubuntu and Mint repositories for long-term release tend to lag behind, so they've set up their own line repository. You can set it up here with these commands. Um, these slides will be available online later if, uh, if you want to do that, but that's directly from their documentation page. Um, Fedora, it's available. It's under Kaliger Krita. It's part of the Kaliger suite as well. For a lot of them. And then, of course, you've also got um, Debian, Chakra, OpenSUSE, Arch Gentoo, and FreeBSD. They also offered on Windows, and I'm sorry to say that all my comics and most of the screenshots here were taken on Windows. I had some trouble getting my, my pressure sensitivity working on my Mint VM, uh, and I was also having trouble learning the program, so I defaulted to what I already had running um, on my gaming rig. There's also a Mac version. I've got it installed. I was hoping to do some live demos. It doesn't work very well. It's more of a technical proof of concept right now. Um, I can't even draw a straight line without it kind of staggering and freaking out. So, unfortunately, we won't be doing any live demos. Um, and then, if you're really a masochist, you can compile it yourself. Um, they've got an old document from 2013 that talks about how to do it. David Revoir put it on. Um, he's a huge contributor to Krita with documentation, brushes, tutorials, things like that. Uh, a lot of what I know now, I learned from him. Um, but he has a guide up there with some, with some pictures that's illustrated and things like that. So, let's get started with the interface. At first glance, any digital painting program or 3D program or anything like that is scary as heck. It's, there's tons of stuff going on. It's daunting. You start trying to click on it. It doesn't do anything. So let's break it down and go through it. Once you get over the initial learning curve of getting into digital, it's an amazing way. I love traditional art. Watercolor is one of my most favoriteest things to do. I also love this now. Um, it, it just, like I said, there's so many things you can do with it. So breaking it down here, 
Um, this is what it looks like, the slides as I was working on them. Um, the initial is the window. So I point out the window in general because Crypto allows you to open multiple windows. If you have multiple screens, you can pop multiple windows. The only thing is I'm not 100% sure why. They're not interactive with each other, so if you open a document in one and the other, it doesn't translate back and forth. Um, I didn't get a chance to really look into what that feature's for, but it's there if you want it. Um, the menu, of course, like any program, you've got the normal menu. Right underneath that is our file, brush, and FX settings. We'll go through each one of these a little bit more in detail. Around that, you have your dockers. What I've done here, uh, even though there's not anything docked to the top, I highlighted it because you can dock in all three areas. And then, of course, the image or the canvas where you're actually doing your work. Notice in the upper uh, right-hand corner, I've highlighted as well. When you're in the mode that I'm in here, uh, the, if you full screen something, the image controls are going to be up there. So I want to make sure and point that out. First time I did it, I was like, how do I minimize it again? I actually had to look it up because it wasn't that obvious. Um, and then down here at the bottom, we've got some miscellaneous stats, some view options, and things like that that we'll get into. Here's a recap slide. If anybody wants it, I just threw it in there um, with all the highlighting intact. And we'll move into Dust Menu. Um, just like any program, you've got new, open, save, open existing document. You can import and export from here. Uh, it will export and import uh, Photoshop files. It will not do GIMP files. It's not compatible with the native GIMP format. A um, couple of things to point out that here, though, are the save incre incremental version and save incremental backup features. Um, now, the incremental version will essentially, exactly like it says, it's going to go ahead and save it, append dot .xxx, and then switch the current document to that. Um, the incremental backup's a little bit nicer. The hotkey is F4, and what that does is it saves it without actually opening it. So, Krita can be a bit memory intensive. Um, <clears throat> So that's a great way when you're working, just hit it real quick, especially if you're using the Bleeding Edge version. They've added animation in the alpha version of, uh, two, or the latest test version, and it's going to be in 3.0. Um, if you're playing with it, I suggest using this feature heavily. Uh, even with the stable version of 2.9 on Windows, I had quite a few crashes. Um, but it does do automatic backups as well, so it was able to recover most of my files most of the time. Um, but save, save, save. Next, we'll move on to the main configuration. Um, there's a couple of different, so what's built, one of the things that's built in that I really like is the ability to change the theme right off. Um, reading through artist documentation, stuff like that, a lot of people say that if you're looking at a really bright screen, it, it, it damages your color perception. So it's, you know, your, your values will be off or your hues will be off. Um, by setting it to a darker background in general, it tends to help that or a more neutral background. So I've set this one, uh, this is Krita Neutral that we're working with here. Um, Configure Krita under settings. This is going to be the main configuration file for most system options that you're going to have to mess with. We'll go through a couple of them later on. Um, and then up here at the top, the configure toolbars, that's where you're going to uh, change. You can change everything that you see on the blue area of the toolbar that we were talking about, uh, which we'll be getting into next. Um, so when we open a new file, I lied, we're doing a new file. Mate. When we open a new file, there's several different options. Um, the first one, recent documents, if you click on that, it brings up a paneled list of all the documents you've been working with. Really quick way to open it. You've got your custom document, which we'll start going through here in a minute. Um, and then you've got create from clipboard. This is one of the coolest features. So when I draw, I use a lot of reference images. And a lot of times I'll just Google real quick, you know, I need to know how cloth folds. So I'll Google a cloth image real quick, copy it to clipboard, and then I can use uh, the hotkey is actually shift. Let's see, I've got it here somewhere. Shift, uh, control shift N. It'll bring it in as a new document. In, in my working space so I can rearrange my windows and just have my, doc, my reference right there. Um, really, really cool feature that I like a lot. Underneath there, you've got your templates. All templates are is essentially saved files. It saves all the layer information, all the picture information, but you can set them up. So if uh, for this presentation, you know, if I was going to do a, a comic character that was going to be in every corner, I could set them up as a template, all his information would be saved, and I could just start from that template every time if I wanted to. Um, up here at the top, obviously, you can name your file. Um, here we have the image size uh, options. Now, let me see. So the image size can consist of a few things, um, including a drop down list with some predefined options that emulate actual paper and things like that. Um, the width and the height, pixel density. So this is the main thing you're going to be looking at when working digitally. 
Um, you've also got your PPI there, or, or sometimes known as DPI. There's a little bit of confusion around this sometimes. Um, what the, when you're working digitally or just on a screen, all you care about is pixel dimension. Whether it's your screen size, 1024 <laughs> by 1024, or whatever it is, that's all that matters. It has no, no other options for resolution. PPI, pixels per inch, or DPI, dots per inch, is specifically used when you're printing. It tells the printer how many dots or points to put per inch. So the higher that number is, the higher the resolution of the image that you print. Um, I've been told, some of, my some of my reading around 300 is, is roughly high res. I set mine to that and just leave it, although I don't have any plans to print anything, so it's not that big of a deal. Um, there is a, a hot button to set the screen size, which is pretty cool, and then you can obviously change from uh, landscape or portrait view. Uh, and then finally, if you get a size that you work with constantly or, or a setup that you like with any of these options, you can save it as a preset there in the bottom right corner of the highlighted area. Um, looking over the color. So this, again, this section has more to do with printing, um, or at least some of it. It's, I've really been trying hard to grasp these concepts. Um, there, it's, it's more for photo manipulation. When I said that Krita has some pretty deep photo manipulation options that you wouldn't expect out of just a pure painting program, this is what I was talking about. Um, to, to understand what the problem, or what these are for, we kind of have to look at what the problem is that it's trying to solve for. Um, in traditional pigment painting, when you add colors together, they get muddier and darker. What happens is that the color absorbs, or all the, all the colors are absorbed into whatever you're doing, and the color you want to see is reflected back at you. The more pigments you add, the less that you get reflected back, so the darker your values and everything becomes. When you're working with a screen, this is actually known as CMYK, cyan, magenta, yellow, black. Um, when you're working on a screen, you get red, green, and blue, RGB. The reason being, on LCD screens, the way that they create color is by three color channels, red, blue, red green, and blue. And different varying light levels of these combined creates different colors. This is known as additive. When you turn them all the, all, all the way up, you get pure white. Um, because of this basic difference, if I was just going to print something from RGB, it's not going to print the same colors. It's going to look completely different. Um, so that's where we get color profiles from. This is a, this is a really scary, in-depth, um, yeah, I don't know how this works. That's, that's what I'm going to say about that. Um, Essentially, what these are is they're 3D representations of all the possible colors that you can use. Um, the, the computer has the, the ability to make more colors than the screen can display. So when you're talking about printing, the possibility of having more colors, uh, and then the conversion from RGB to CMYK, what the, um, sorry, the color spaces do specifically is they build almost a 3D representation like a cube with X, Y, and Z points pointing to different colors. Um, so the color profile for RGB has them all built in, and the color profile for CMYK has, CMYK has them all built in, but in different spaces. The reason you can toggle your color spaces is if I'm working in the CMYK color space, it'll convert to RGB and back. That's how it does that conversion to, to do color accuracy when you're printing, essentially. Um, and then going back up here, just looking one more time, we've also got the, uh, the model is RGB. That's kind of what we're talking about. The bit depth. Uh, that has to do with how, many, how much memory per pixel is allowed. So every time you make a mark on the screen, the, the program has to determine how it's going to add to the color underneath. Or if you're working on a fully transparent, it has to know how, how transparent to make it. So there's always some kind of calculation going on there. Setting this higher can make those calculations faster, but it is a big burden on your memory the higher you go. Um, so playing with this can perform, per, improve performance a little bit. Um, and then finally, down here at the bottom, we've got a couple of just canvas options. Uh, first one, layers. We'll get into what layers are. Anybody who's worked with digital painting and, or uh, any kind of Photoshop programs or anything like that, you already be familiar with layers. I always set mine to a minimum of two, just how I prefer to work. Um, then we can set the background image or the background color. Again, pure white can damage your perception of the colors you use. I always set mine to a neutral gray when I start. Um, and then you can set that as whether you want to have the first layer be a big gray panel or a transparent and the canvas color is, it, the program just does the canvas color is gray. Um, there we go. So moving on to the toolbar. This is the toolbar settings that I was talking about before. Just point out the different separators there so you can kind of correlate what's on there. Uh, the first three, open, save, new. Nothing special. Uh, the second ones here, these are gradients and patterns used with the fill tools. 
just like a paint bucket, if you're going to splash onto a canvas, this will fill the canvas with whatever you've selected here. Great for adding textures and things to your images. Next, we've got the foreground and background colors. Um, all digital painting programs that I've worked with have this. Your background color is going to be usually white. Your foreground color starts as black. This is a little bit misleading because in Krita, if I'm using the canvas color rather than having my first uh, layer as just a, a big blocky image of gray, um, it's a little bit off. But you can use the hotkey X to switch between them. So the, the way I like to use this is I'll pick two colors that I'm working with a lot, and I'll just use X to cycle between them back and forth. The next thing here are all the brush options we have. Um, we'll get into some of this a little bit later. The first one is the actual brush engine settings. The second one is the list of brush presets that you can use. The third one is for blending modes. What blending modes are is when I said uh, before that every time you make a mark on the, the page, it has to do calculations. Blending modes change the way those calculations are done. Um, the most simple one, or the one that you'll use very, very constantly in Krita, is the eraser blending mode. There is no eraser tool in Krita, although there are eraser brushes. It's kind of hard to, kind of a hard concept to get it first. Um, but any, any brush you're using, you can toggle the next one there, uh, the little eraser, and that'll turn it into an eraser. And all that does is change the, the blending mode from additive, add these two colors together when I swipe across them, to subtractive, take away color when I swipe across it. Um, it makes a lot more sense to me to do it that way, uh, and it, when you get used to it, it's, it's really fast. The hotkey for this is E, so if you're sketching and you don't like it, press E, just do a quick erase, press E again and get back to work. Um, the next thing there is uh, the preserve alpha button. What alphas are is that transparency I was talking about. So you have color and transparency. Transparency is also known as alpha. When you set this on, it will prevent you from adding, changing any transparency on the image at all. So essentially, if I have line work, if I've drawn a circle, turn on uh, the transparency lock, and I color across the image, only the lines of the circle are going to get updated. Um, and I think I have an example of that a little bit later on as well. Um, and then the last one, if you've played around with your brushes and it no longer acts like the proper brush, you can just reset it. Um, here we have a couple more brush options. You've got opacity, which changes how much the transparency changes when you make a mark, and then size. There's also a hotkey for size. If you hold down the shift key and then click and drag anywhere on the canvas, it'll change the size. So you can uh, use the highlighted teal there to change the drop down. There's one more option called flow. Opacity and flow are very, very similar. Um, opacity changes the way that the brush transparency acts. Flow changes how much it affects. Usually you'll see this as um, like just softening around the edges of the brush more than anything else. Um, I honestly, I don't usually screw with flow too much. Um, and then the next one here, a couple of cool options that, that Krita just throws out there by default. You can do vertical and horizontal mirroring. Turn this on, sketch on one side, it's mirrored instantly over the other side. This is great when you're just starting out. If any of you in here are artists, you know the worst thing to do is just stare at a blank canvas. A lot of times I'll slap these bad boys on and just start making marks, see where it takes me, and then come up with an image from there if I don't have something in mind already. And then finally, workspaces, which you can't see. I've clipped the top left corner of the program here. You can't see it. We'll circle back to what workspaces are. Um, the next thing to talk about are the dockers. Um, under the settings menu, we can go to dockers, and this is going to where, you, where you're going to see all the dockers that are available. Clicking the check mark will display it somewhere on the screen. Unclicking it will hide it. Uh, why do I love dockers? Because they're scalable. Any of the red lines here can be dragged. You can rearrange the space any way that you want. They're also stackable. You can have multiple dockers on top of each other that you can change just with the, uh, the tabs there. And you can dock them or set them free. Um, and some of the later uh, pictures that I have, I've pulled the dockers out so you can see them a little bit easier. Um, but a couple of them, like the tool option docker, is, is so important you can't even hide it. It's not an option to hide the tool, do the tool option docker. Um, so if you have a lot of, if you're tweaking a lot of stuff, you can pull that docker out right next to your image and just work between them real close. This is uh, the first docker that I wanted to talk about, um, but we'll go through the different options on the docker first. This is the reference image docker, which again, I use a lot of reference images, so I think this is the coolest thing in the world. Um, first up here, you can collapse it. If you've got multiple dockers on either side of the screen and you only use one every once in a while, you can collapse it and make more room for your color picker or whatever. Um, you can lock and unlock them so that you don't accidentally drag them somewhere else. Clicking on the middle area is how you move them from one area to another or dock them or make them free. And then this is a, this is a hot button. So if I drag it out in the middle and I'm working with it and I just want to dock it real quick, I can press that, it'll go back, back to exactly where I pulled it from. If I press it again, it'll go back to exactly where I had it on the canvas. So it's pretty nice. 
Um, and then, of course, you can hide it with just the X there. The reference image docker. So what this one does is it provides you with, here we can see a list of all the files that I had um, working on this. Uh, double clicking, normally down here at the bottom, there would be uh, previews. If you double click on a folder that has images in it, it'll give you thumbnail previews at the bottom. I didn't have any here, or uh, I didn't double click into the directory because I wanted to show the directory tree, uh, but those do show up there. Double clicking on any image either in the preview or in the list will bring it to the images tab, the second part of the Docker. The images tab has a drop down at the top where you can select between all the open ones you have, and clicking and dragging anywhere on the image itself will maximize that space so that you can zoom in on certain parts really quickly and get a good look at it, and you can pick colors directly from this Docker. So if you have an image that you want to work with and, and you know you're going to be copying it or pulling some information from it, you can get the, the colors right from there. It's pretty cool. Um, the advanced color selector, Docker just to pick your colors. One thing I wanted to point out, um, if you click on the settings up here and then the drop down here, you can change what you're looking at. A lot of people have different workflows. Some prefer one, some prefer the other. I like the square ones because um, one of the tutorials I read, it's really easy to pick your values. Whatever color you're at, you go halfway to black. That's how you get your shadows. Um, real, real simple way to do it. Undo history, super important. Hotkeys, control Z. Um, it can be very, very memory intensive. Uh, so if you right click in there, you can tell Krita to collaborate everything within a certain number of seconds, a certain number of strokes. Um, I think there's a couple other options with grouping the strokes together, things like that. But it'll combine all those into a single action for the purposes of history, which can save you on memory. Uh, and then finally here, um, you can change the stack size. Again, configure settings, the Krita main configuration under the general tab. You can change the number of uh, history that it remembers. The toolbox. This is a beast. This is all the tools that Krita has to offer. Don't be afraid of it. There's only a couple that you ever use anyway, um, unless you have a really specific <clears throat> use case. We'll go through them real quick. Another, the way that I keep this straight is I break it up into sections. The first section, kind of specialty brushes here. Um, shape handling tools used for working with vector images, uh, text, obviously for setting text, you can edit gradients, things like that. Um, next we have the drawing tools. The freehand brush, that's going to be your bread and butter, what you normally draw with. Um, then you've got another one that's really cool is the multi-brush tool. So it's going to go ahead and put like eight dots on the screen, and as you move it moves them all together. Another way to get some really cool things up just playing around. Um, you've got your transform edit, your color fill options your assistance, and then this last one is selection, which is cutting off there at the bottom. Um, and we'll go through them a little bit more here. Uh, so again, the tool, the, option, the tool options is so important you can't hide it. This is where you're going to change how any of those tools interact with the canvas. Um, with the brush tool specifically, it does some assistant smoothing for you to get better lines. If you do manga or comic art, this is great for doing your, your line work. Um, this is the brush preset docker that I was talking about. Krita ships with all these brush presets, but you can also download them from online. Again, David Rubois has some great ones that are out there. Um, and then you can make your own as well, which we'll hopefully look at. I just realized we're on a little short on time. Um, by right-clicking on the brush, we can edit the tags. So since we have so many, we keep them straight by adding them to different tag groups, which you can edit here or in the top right corner. Um, you can create your own tags. You can move them. Uh, back and forth, you can add brushes to multiple tags. Just a great way to keep track of them. If you right-click anywhere on the palette, you get the pop-up palette. Or the canvas, you get the pop-up palette. One of my favorite things about Krita. It's got everything you need to, work, to paint without having any of the Docker's presence. So you can go to full-screen canvas, right-click, and you've got your color selector in the middle. It remembers your recent colors in the yellow ring. And then you've got your brushes set by tag, which is determined by clicking on the purple there at the bottom. And then your foreground and background colors in the blue. Um, and this is just an image of the different, uh, picking the different tags. So again, the pop-up palette, you can add more brushes to it through configure uh, Krita. Uh, keep in mind, the more brushes you add, it doesn't change the amount of real estate there is, so you're going to get smaller and smaller icons the more you add. Okay. Uh, images, there are two image modes. This is tabs. They're going to be through the top there. I don't like this method. You can only view one at a time. There's no option for viewing multiple ones. Under the configure Krita, you can set it up under the, the uh, sub-windows, which is what I normally use, which, again, controls are in the upper right if you're maximizing. 
One of the coolest things is the ability to do multiple views. So if I'm working on something, and this image, by the way, was me thinking about how I used to think about working on computers. I was not a technical guy before I started working in uh, Iraq space. Um, but if you're working on an image, you want to zoom in, you can zoom in and change something and then still see how it's going to look on your overall image, which is really cool. Uh, and then finally, the never-ending canvas. If you scroll to any edge, you can click on this, and it's going to go ahead and extend your pixel dimension in that direction. Um, and then back to workspaces. So in the upper, this is the screenshot of the upper left-hand corner of the program. Click that drop-down, and you can set up, once you've got everything customized just the way you like it, you can add your own workspace. And anytime you, you know, you're playing around, you've messed it up, you can go back to that workspace default. If you ever screw around with the program too much and get lost, you can go to Big Paint, which is the default. And then down here at the bottom, on the very, very left, it changes the way that the uh, selection is displayed, either the marching ants, which is typical, or a masking mode where it basically shows red highlights on everything that's not selected, show you which brush you're working with, show you which color spaces you're using, and then uh, pixel dimensions down here at the bottom. I apologize, this is cut off. Um, next to pixel dimensions is the memory usage of the canvas you're working with, which is really cool if you're running your memory usage out a lot. You can see which one's killing you there. Um, and then at the bottom, there's also the zoom levels down there and a button at the far bottom right-hand corner that cycles through preset zoom levels. So, uh, let's look at layers. Uh, this is a Docker for layers. Of course, my good friend Repsar. Um, in order to understand the way our layers work, I always think about old transparency machines. I see a couple faces in here that I would expect don't know what a transparency machine is. Um, but when mommies and daddies went to school, they, had, uh, they didn't have fancy projectors, so we had to use uh, sheets of clear plastic that had different images on each one, and you could stack them on top of each other to make a more complete image. That's exactly what layers do with the added benefit of being able to work together. So if I create a layer on top of another layer and start blending in colors, they will still blend together. They're not completely separate by default. Um, there's quite a few things here on the screen. Not real hard to get a grasp on, though. Uh, these are the main options. You've got visibility, lock, alpha lock, and lock transparency. We'll go through these a little bit more. Um, the blending modes that you can set per layer. So the one we looked at in the toolbar, that's going to be per brush. This is per layer. And then you can set the opacity. Great when you're working with line art. You've done a quick sketch, and then you want to you clean it up with some really crisp lines. Set the opacity to half and start painting over it. Um, and then you can change the, the way that the layers view out. I prefer the default to anything else that's, that's available. Um, down here at the bottom, we've got new layer. We've got copy selected layer to a new layer above the one that's there. And layers work in a hierarchy. The inheritance works up. So the parent layer is below the child layer. Okay? We can move the layers up or down, change parent-child relationship. Add or remove layers from a group. Here you can see, and I'll highlight it in a little bit, but essentially when you're working with a ton of layers and a ton of different things going on, you can separate them into groups to kind of clean up your work area. Um, and then there at the bottom is layer properties that you can set up, which I will get into a little bit more, and then delete layer. Uh, first one is visibility. Here I've disabled the green color layer that I have. You can see that it just goes away. The next one um, is the lock. If I set that lock, I can no longer make changes to that layer at all. And then the next one is going to be the uh, alpha inheritance. Those of you familiar with Photoshop or other digital painting programs, you might be familiar with what's called clipping masks. Uh, Krita doesn't have clipping masks. Instead, it's got this alpha inheritance. And this is another reason you might want to use groups. What alpha inheritance does is if I set it on the child layer, it's not going to let me change anything unless there are pixels underneath it. So here I've set the three black bars. You can see that only the colored areas are where the pixels are on the parent layer. If I turn it off, I get to see the rest of the color. It's an important thing to note that if you're using the uh, alpha inheritance, you're still painting on the layer you're working with. Those pixels are still being modified, but they're just being hidden. So if you turn that off later or change your parent-child relationships, your image is going to look vastly different. Um, next, the final one there is alpha locks. Alpha locks are very similar to alpha inheritance, with the exception of you're working on the, the layer you're with. There's no parent-child relationship. Um, here, I've set it on, painted three green circles. Here, I've turned it off and painted three green circles. You can see that it goes around the edges, and then I've turned it back on. The important thing to note here is that with uh, the alpha lock on, you can't change anything. Turning it on and off will not affect the way that the image looks. Uh, layer properties, one of the most useful things about this, uh, you've got your opacity there. You can rename your layers, again, for, for cleanliness. But you can turn on and off which channels you're seeing. 
So here I've turned off all of the green pixels in the image. There's no green light coming through. So we've got purple tar or red tar. Um, you can do this to work in grayscale. It's a great way to save memory because uh, the less color channels you have, the less calculations need to be done. And you can always turn it back on later if you want to start working that way. Um, there are multiple, multiple types. Group layers, highlighting the group there, as I said, just a way to clean it up. Um, you've got fill layers, which fill layers will fill the entire layer with a color or um, texture. This is a great way to get some a feel. So if you wanted to have a, the feel of doing work on charcoal paper, you can add some, some rough gradients and then set the opacity low enough that it just looks like it's, it's the paper underneath that's giving it texture. Um, the next one, the paint layer. This is raster. So let's talk a little bit about raster and vector. So what raster is is when you're changing pixel information. That's what Krita does. It's bread and butter. It's a raster image editor. Um, vector layers are a little bit different. There are some other programs out there. An open source one is Inkscape. Um, vectors use a lot more by graphic artists. So what happens when I paint with raster, again, it, change, it does math to see how the colors are going to change. With vector, it's actually a series of nodes on the screen. Um, here we've got two, two circles. This one's paint. This one's uh, vector. Because the way the vector works, if I've got a square, it's got four nodes. And then there are mathematical equations that tell it where to draw the lines for that and then fill them in. Because of that, I can edit them. I can cut them in half just by you know, playing with the slider there. I can resize them without any loss of resolution. That's the most important thing. And you can work with multiple vector objects on the same layer. They will never combine or, or touch each other because they're each being drawn independently with those mathematics. Um, and I apologize. I had a zoomed-in version. The biggest problem with, with working with raster as you zoom in, that it, it still retains that pixel information, so it gets very, very pixelated. When you see images that have square edges or circles that look like they're, they're kind of stair-stepped, that's a product of, of raster being resized. Vector doesn't do that. Um, file layers are really, really cool. What, what I've done here is I've opened two of my files, uh, just my reptar.jpg, and any changes, so these, these layers can't be modified directly, but any changes to the file that are then saved automatically updates everything in the program. So if you're working on a scene that say you've got a lot of soldiers with emblems on their shoulders, you can set each one of those emblems as a file layer, and you change one, it will update all of them automatically. Um, transparency and local. Uh, so masks, okay. Masks, so if you're painting your house and you don't want to get paint on your baseboards or your light switches, you use masking tape to cover them. That's exa exactly what masks are in digital painting. Um, there are a few different types. Uh, transparency and local. Uh, local selection masks, what that does, is, or I'm sorry, the transparency mask, it just hides everything else. It's important to note that when you're working with a transparency mask, again, everything else is still being modified. You can only see what's selected. You can fix this by doing a local selection mask. And this is the other selection mode. This one's the marching ants. This one's the mask mode that I was talking about. Um, the, uh, sorry. Local selection, what that does is it remembers your selection. So if I make a sol local selection mask and then I hide it, it turns it off. I can then go clear my selection, work normally, turn the local selection mask back on, and it immediately reselects that and, and prevents me from editing anything outside of the selection. Um, the next one, we've got filter layers. Filters are, again, like um, kind of like setting... Uh, um, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> apologies. Um, filters are a great way to add effects... They modify the way the image looks. One of the most useful ones that I saw is the color to alpha filter. So if I brought my Reptar image in that I've done, drawn by hand and then scanned, I can use color to alpha to go in and select it, and it changes all white to transparency. It, and this is not a non-destructive change. So if I turn this layer off, delete this layer, the white comes right back. Now if I want to make it permanent, I can go to layer properties um, and then change the, I'm sorry, I can flatten it by right clicking there. Um, merge with the layer below. That'll go ahead and make the two layers the same. It makes it a permanent change. Uh, and then we can change the background back to gray so we don't see the transparent uh, image behind it. Um, you can also do filters specifically with mass selections. So here I've just selected the green layer and set a motion blur. You can see that's blurred, but the colors on the tongue, the line art, none of that is. Um, so it's per layer there with the masks. Um, clone layers, very, very similar to file layers with the exception that they, uh, only the parent layer can be edited. So here I've got two. I make a change to one. The other one gets updated automatically. Um, you can't edit clone layers unless you move them with a transform mask, which we'll get in here to a second. 
Um, the transform tool, one of my favorite tools about Krita, and honestly one of the best things about working digitally. It gives you the ability to select something and then start dragging it around and making changes. Um, here I've gone ahead and set a transparency mask, uh, or I'm sorry, a transform mask on my Reptar image. I've moved it over to the side with the transform. So these are two different layers, the second one being a clone layer. I've moved the clone layer over to the side with the transform mask. When I go to move the original image, the transform mask and the clone disappear, but then they come back in relation exactly to where the image was. A lot of different use cases. Uh, David Rubois' tutorial on this, he sets up a bouquet of flowers. He paints one flower, clones the rest, moves them around into a bouquet, and then he can edit that one flower and the whole bouquet gets updated. Um, so the transform tools. Uh, here we've got the tool options. There's several different. I'm going to run through them here real quick. The original free transform. Everything's going to transform around that, uh, that dot in the middle. You can grab any one of the boxes to change it. It'll slide. You can hold shift to constrain it so that it won't change the proportions of the image as you're moving it. And then a, a feature that's pretty exclusive to Krita, I believe, is the ability to transform in perspective. If you hold down control, you can transform into space. This is really great for setting, again, those emblems or things like that, getting to match up with where your character's sitting and getting the angle right. Um, you've also got the, um, the, I'm sorry, that's the cage mode. The grid mode, I'm sorry, this is the grid mode. What it does is it sets a preset number of dots on the grid. You can drag the dots and it'll change it. Um, they're weighted, as you can see there, as they move. The next one is going to be the cage mode, which you can set your own points and then drag those around. Here I've opened his mouth wider without actually really destroying the image. I just need to go back and do a little touch-up to clean it up. Um, great, great way to, you know, you've worked on an image, you've got everything done, but you just don't like the pose. Cage, cage is great for that. Uh, and then finally, the liquify. Liquify it gives you a brush type option that you can just go in and click drag the pixels around. Okay. Blending mode. Let's talk a little bit more about that. Um, what I've done here is drawn some fire. Um, again, they changed the way the map is done. You can see here, it's kind of hard to tell, but it, it lightens up as I do it. What the color dodge mode does is it inverts the selection and then divides it in half. Um, it comes out with a much brighter uh, ending. This is often used for magic effects or lasers or something like that. This is an image by David Rebois from his tutorial um, because I didn't think that mine really did it justice. Um, another blending mode that's, that's really useful is the color blending mode. Um, what it does, it allows you to add color, but it will not change the value of your black and white work. So if you'd like to work in grayscale first and add color later, this is a great mode to, to ensure that you're not changing your values. Um, and then the final one is overlay. I like this one. It, it's, it's kind of a mix of two other blending modes. If you're working with a lighter value, it will only affect the highlights. If you're working with a darker value, it will only affect the shadows. And you can see here I've picked two colors that have nothing to do with Reptar. The lighter pink color, you can see, was applied a little bit to the lighter areas. The darker purple color to some of the shadowing. But that was from broad brush strokes. I just dragged across the image, and it, it only updated in certain places. So. I have a question. Yes. Um, back on the slide that you were doing the blending with the, the adding the color to the grayscale. Mm -hmm. um, now, would you be working with that in layers? So you create your image in grayscale um, as a parent layer, and then add the color as exactly. a child layer. Exactly. Um, important thing, if you're, not, if you're working with the layer blending modes, then the child layer has to be a duplicate layer, and then you can go paint over that, and then it changes the addition. Um, you don't have to do it that way. You can set okay, the blending so mode for the brush. Paint over the, the gray stuff and then use the brush, but you just have to make sure you set the opacity correctly? Not the opacity, the blending mode for the brush. Blending mode. Oh. Exactly. So you set the blending mode to color for the brush. You don't have to have a separate layer. You can paint directly on it. For cleanliness reasons and oops reasons, I prefer to work with multiple layers instead, um, but it, it's your preference there. Um, I apologize, this slide here got a little bit borked, um, but this is a, a view of the different blending modes we have. Uh, Krita has at least five times more blending modes than Photoshop does, according to their documentation. Um, clicking on any of the X's here will bring it up to the favorites at the top so you can quickly select it, uh, but these are all just different blending modes that are, that are collapsed in there. Can we work with uh, Krita and uh, Photoshop? Yes, you can export as a PSD and you can import PSDs directly. Uh, and it will retain the layer information. Um, guides, really cool little thing here. Um, I just wanted to touch on. Got a lot of different options. The red is to move. You can adjust them around. Basically, you just draw lines out on the screen. And then it, you can set in the tool options the assistant, and it will contrain it. Um, 
We're running out of time here, guys. I apologize when I made these slides. Like I said, I fell in love with credit, and I went a little crazy. Um, so I'm going to run through some of the last ones here pretty quick. But you can see you can have multiple guides there. And as you put your brush on, it will actually give you tell you which one you're going to walk to. Um, the GMake Paint, I'm going to run through this one super fast. Um, what it is is a way to color your line art if you're working with comics and stuff. Uh, you can read the slides to, to find out how to actually set it up. But here I've opened it up. I set color nodes on there by left clicking with the color that I want, press the space bar, and it goes ahead and fills in the color for me. Adding more color nodes, pressing space bar, that's how you get through this workflow. You can right click on the nodes to remove them. You can right click on a color to change to that color real quick to add extra nodes. And it can get pretty intense. You can see the mouth area. I've added a lot of nodes to do correction and things like that to make sure it works out. But I didn't have to touch this image up at all. Once I finished with this, I pressed standard and I rendered it. And it came out exactly like I wanted it. I didn't have to go and do any cleanup or anything. I did have to reorganize my layers to put the line art back on top. Um, and then split layers, what this does, awesome with the, with the GMake tool, um, it will take every color and split it up for you into a different layer. Um, so that's how I got all the different colors for Reptar. It ad automatically adds the alpha lock, so you can't change it. So I was able to quickly go in and just add some highlights and shadowing without really, I mean, it took me maybe two minutes, right? Um, really cool stuff. Uh, the brush engines. This is uh, Kiki the Cyber Squirrel, which is actually the Krita mascot. Um, one of the best things about Krita is all the different brush engines they have. And again, it's kind of outside the scope of a beginner tutorial for, for what you would see. But I'll run through them real quick so you can see some of the stuff and some of the work that's been done with them. Um, Pixel, your basic brush. Uh, you can change the tips to get different um, effects. But all it does is change what you're doing on the screen. Nothing special. This was made specifically Wix with Pixel um, by an artist named uh, Lisa Gessner. I probably mangled that name really bad. Um, but I, I actually watched the YouTube video on how she made this. All she used was a Pixel brush. Uh, color smudge blends them together like, a, like oil painting or something would be. Um, really, really fun to use, really good. I, uh, I had a video, short video I was going to show, but instead we'll skip right past it. The, the blending mode she used here, uh, first she drew in all her lines, like kind of rough sketched it like you would see a normal pencil sketch. And she used a blending mode to, to bring all that into different values and things like that. Um, tangent normal. You can actually edit 3D models. So normal maps are a way to provide uh, light and shadow information to 3D models as they move around in games and environments. Um, you can edit those directly within Krita with a special brush, which is kind of cool. Uh, the sketch brush provides some really cool um, effects. The closer you get to a line you've previously drawn, it's going to fill that area in with some random noise. It's, it's really nice for just getting some marks on the page. Um, bristle brush, like your traditional brush, it's, it's going to look more like that. Um, again, this image she did uh, with the background with the bristle brush. Um, shape brush this is a really unique one. I wrote out high there. All I did was run the outline of high, and it filled it in for me. The bottom ones here are just me making like S-curve squiggly lines. You can see it gets a pretty, pretty odd effect. Um, spray, just like a spray paint can. Uh, hatching, this one's kind of cool and unique to Krita. Uh, it changes what, basically as you paint, it brings that stuff out from the background, whichever one, whichever tool you choose or whichever brush head you choose there. Um, grid, similar except it only makes dots. Um, the curve tools will throw a little extra noise around the outside of your, your, your turns, kind of like the sketch brush, but specifically made for circles and things like that. Um, dynamic brush, this adds a heavy smoothing to it. When I made these circles, it was really, really tight, just scribbles that I made, and it, it throws them out wider. It, it smooths them out as much as it can to make it more appealing. Um, particle brush, again, just adds some noise. And then uh, the deform brush, I ran a smiley face, and then I just drew a line through it, and that's what came out. Um, and then the chalk brush, I like the chalk brush a lot. It really does feel like working with regular chalk. Um, I encourage you guys to, to take a look at all the brush brushes and what you can do. You can also make uh, custom brush heads yourself. Uh, there's quite a few things here but I'm just about out of time, so I'll run through it real quick. Um, essentially, all you're going to do, though, is you draw your own. It's based on the alpha, so black and white. The, the whiter areas or the more transparent areas are obviously going to be more transparent. The, the darker areas are going to be better. Um, you can import that as a brush head. This is for the pixel brush. I have basically picked a brush that I like already, how it works, how it feels, and then just use that as my, my template. And you can see here what it does in the, in the right now that I'm done making it. It's, it's off the color smudge, so it blends it together. I wanted to make kind of a fire effect. Um, one thing to note here is when I import it there, but the up here at the top where you get your preview, that purple box is where you set your preview for your brush. So then you can add it to your tags, 
and it's right there, uh, ready to use, however you want to identify it. Um, again, when I built this presentation, I mean, you can see how much I've thrown in here. This is all from Crypto Documentation, David Rebois, and a couple of random YouTube videos telling me about how this stuff works. I absolutely love Crypto Documentation. Um, they're always looking for help. If you're interested in getting involved, if you're a developer at C++ and Qt, uh, you can go to that URL. If you're not a developer, which is what the second one should say, um, they always look for people to do user documentation, <laughs> tutorials, or translations to other languages. Um, so get out there and paint something. I apologize, guys. I know I ran through the last bit a little bit longer, but um, yeah, what do you got? Um, so the question was uh, if the Crit of Gemini is able to customize so that um, all the little buttons and things are more accessible. I honestly don't know. Uh, from everything I read, Crit of Gemini works exactly like Crit of Desktop, with the exception of it works with touch, um, and it is it's supposed to be more optimized for like the surface. But I haven't had any chance to play with it or any experience on it, unfortunately. Crit of Gemini, and it's actually available on Steam. Um, yeah, you can go get it off Steam. Um, uh, the presentation, um, I will have to find out exactly how to get up there, and then it will be up there. So, this evening. It will be up there this evening. Yes, sir? Um, have you used the wrap mode at all for drawing, like, textures and stuff? Yes. Uh, one of the things I put, forgot to put a slide in, thank you for bringing it up. Another thing that Crito will do, um, you can set on the canvas wrap, and... When you're working with low, uh, certain games, well, actually any game now, they, they basically all do the same thing. They tile textures repeatedly, but you don't want to see seams or anything like that. Krita, if you have OpenGL enabled, will allow you to, if you draw a line off the top, it comes right back on the bottom. Kind of like old playing Pac-Man. Go off one side, come right back on the other. It's great for making seamless textures. Thank you for bringing that up. Anybody else? Yes, back here in the corner, far back. So I haven't, I'm not sure if you can bring in like Maya files and things like that because they're going to be, I'm, I'm not sure, you would probably have to export them as a common format. I'm not familiar with the file types they use, so I don't know off the top of my head. Um, the question again was uh, if you can import like Maya and other things. The, the documentation online again is great. They'll be able to tell you which formats it supports. Um, do you know what the default file is for Corel? I'm not sure. Uh, the DD, DDR, somebody said. Yeah, again, the documentation has great stuff on that. I apologize. I don't know what's on my head. Yeah, it may do Corel. I'm, I want to say it probably does, again, because they're, they're shooting for that same market. So it makes sense if you can move between it. All right, guys. Well, I appreciate it. Here's the obligatory rack space hiring slide. Yeah.